Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. With both interests and concerns parallel to Western outlook towards the Muslim world, the rapid changes across regions where Muslim states are situated, including the contradictory views on norms and values, is viewed as being translated into confrontational relationships. To further discuss this topic, I'm joined here in the studio by Ms. Paula Sleer, who is the Middle East Bureau Chief at Russia Today. Welcome. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Mordechai Nissan, who is a scholar of Middle Eastern Studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of the specific topic. The topic is political Islam rather than Islam per se, because the religious um, can be interpreted uh, many ways and... uh, There's an expert here and others uh, who can argue it. It all started for the West um, uh, on September 11. Up to that time, there was an involvement by the West in the Middle East, in in, uh, Muslim countries, and in Muslim countries uh, outside of the Middle East, such as Malaysia, Pakistan, Indonesia. But the um, um, Islamist organizations... Um, which came after the West, Al-Qaeda and then ISIS and their offshoots, this all started, at least in the perceptions of people in the West, some 17 years ago. And from that time on, the question has become, is Islam a negative force? Is it an expansionist force? And only recently, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the... um, Crown Prince of uh, Saudi Arabia, tried to make the distinction between those uh, streams in Islam uh, which are proactive and aggressive and um, try to expand, and the kind of Islam which uh, he believes his country represents, which uh, only wants to uh, keep track of, of its own uh, development. Obviously, there is also the Sunni versus uh, Shiite uh, conflict uh, in Islam, which is part of the entire issue. Ms. Lear? I would agree with that. I'd say if the topic is we're looking at the West versus the Muslim world or Islam, those are not homogenous groups in themselves. Within the Muslim world, as you correctly say, it's very fragmented. You have Shia versus um, Sunni. At the moment, you have so many regional rivalries. You have local conflicts that have expanded into broader conflicts. And I think all of it is also relevant in the context of the Arab Spring and and where the Arab Spring has brought us to now. What we saw happening with the Arab Spring was basically uh, popular uprisings on the Arab street, people basically saying that we want personal politics, we want to be in control of the politics. And we've seen that also happening across Europe. And even with the election of Donald Trump, we see a change in the United States. So it's not a simple equation. It comes within the context of changes sweeping across the, the Arab world, the Muslim world, and the Western world in terms of what people want from their politicians and how they see themselves geopolitically. Dr. Nissan? I think it's important to, in fact, talk about religion because Islam is a religion. It's a religious civilization, not only a religion of uh, principles and somewhat rituals, but it's a religious civilization which is designed to encompass all aspects of life. That's how it was self-defined from the beginning in the Quran itself and in terms of how theologians and philosophers affiliated with, with Islam defined it over the ages. In that respect, I think it's important to consider, therefore, that it as a religion and as, let's say, as a culture began to surface with great power in the latter part of the 20th century. It had been considered after the First World War, one might say, that Islam would be demoted or weak or at least dormant for many years. The Ottoman Empire collapsed. It was the political receptacle of Sunni Islam. Nationalism appeared as an alternative kind of framework or a force of identity and other ideologies, admittedly. But when the latter part of the 20th century comes around, we see that Islam really is rejuvenating and returning. And if I may say, far before 21, uh, you know, 9-11, of course, is a, is a seminal moment. But even before that, clearly, various expressions of the revival of Islam, its militancy, its violence within the Arab world, within the Muslim world, Muslims versus Muslims, appeared virtually everywhere in the Muslim world. Uh, Nevertheless, I'd, I'd 
also like to point that, uh, Mr. Owen, when we're talking about uh, the Muslim world or the Arab world, uh, of course, the Ottoman Empire, which uh, was Muslim by definition, uh, ruled uh, most of those territories in this region and were key adversaries to Western countries. Uh, after the West and particularly the British Empire tried to infiltrate and, and uh uh, defeat the Ottoman Empire. We had the Arab Revolt, which assisted uh, the British in trying to do, uh, recapture ser several territories. And of course, uh, Jordan was incepted out of that in Iraq and other countries following sykes Picot. To what degree did that relationship, which was perceived an, uh, as a uh, turn point uh, for the Arab world in defining its own territories and kind of uh, making a, a linear equation compared to uh, the way the West wants this territories to look like, uh, to what degree does the Arab world see that and remember that? And uh, do we see some kind of relationship to that end that has bolstered relations between the two sides? Your question gives rise to two uh, tangential comments. One is that there are um, movements uh, in Islam which claim that um, uh, wherever Muslims once ruled, be it uh, Vienna or Andalus, Muslims should go back to uh, and plant the Muslim uh, flag again. The other comment is that um, in the mind or in the simplistic mind of uh, the um, Westerner, there is almost an identity between the Arab and the Muslim, which, of course, we know is not uh, the case. Now, take, for instance, uh, Gamal Abdul Nasser, who, uh, when he uh, took over Egypt, uh, had his uh, the philosophy of the revolution published, in which he tried to depict Egypt as the focal point for three uh, concentric uh, circles, the African one, the uh, Muslim one and the Arab one. Uh, it didn't uh, uh, take long for others to resist it. Other Arab countries did not want to follow his rule. Other Muslim countries did not, and so did Africans. So what you saw in other places, for instance, in Syria or Syria and Lebanon, was that uh, Christian thinkers came up with the Ba'ath idea, uh, with the more uh, socialist view of uh, how the Arab countries uh, should behave because they were not Muslims. This problem of, of the non-identity of the Arab and the Muslims in Lebanon, of course, with its uh, Maronite or, or Christian uh, majority. So um, to go back to your question about uh, the revival of an Ottoman Empire, perhaps uh, Erdogan wants to do it. And uh, as was said here, this was his is a very unique uh, case of Sunni Islam, uh, along with Qatar, uh, he is uh, now against others in the uh, Arab and Muslim uh, uh, countries, or okay. camp. Uh, obviously, Turkey, much like Iran, is not uh, an Arab country. But uh, one doesn't uh, sense that people in Egypt or in the Levant want uh, to go back, hark to the uh, halcyon days of Ottoman rule, and wants to see Erdogan as the new sultan. Ms. Lear? The one analogy I want to make is that if you look at the time of the Ottoman Empire, you noticed non Muslim minorities, let's say, for example, Jewish groups coming from pogroms and attacks in Europe and going into the Middle East and Arab countries because they felt safe there. Now the opposite trend is happening where you have Christian communities and other minorities feeling unsafe in countries like Iraq and Syria and wanting to leave. So something seems to have shifted in terms of how they feel and what is their relationship like with the, the Muslim world. And I would go back to the point you made earlier in terms of political Islam. I do think it is significant in terms in terms of how Islam has evolved or how the maybe fringe elements are perceived, but there is something there that is creating a huge distrust between the West and the Muslim world. And that's why people talk about the, the clash of civilizations. Is there a genuine mistrust? Is there a genuine misunderstanding between these, the, the, um, these two entities? Or is it uh, expediency on behalf of the West that has manipulated and for its own self-interest maneuvered 
its 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 actions and its policies in in the Muslim world. Dr. Misson, <coughs> I have to say the term political Islam, which is used very currently, uh, really is what Islam is from the start. Islam is not at all insulted or humiliated if people refer to political Islam. You know, the expression in Arabic is din wa dawla religion and state, meaning from the beginning, Islam sees itself as both a religion and a state, meaning it's a religion which has very clear, explicit, and, and expansive political aspirations. So in that sense, what we're viewing today in our times, political Islam, to use that term, really is Islam at its core. And again, I say it's something which is part of the DNA of Islam. It's not somebody that a Westerner from the West is really imposing upon Islam as such, but rather it's a rather accurate reflection of what Islam sees itself to be from its origins. But here I would just want to take this in a somewhat a different tangent and say that when the, the Muslims find themselves, or the Arab Muslims in particular, find themselves weakened in a certain period of history in the 20th century, and no less as it was pointed out, the two major and very ambitious and strong states today in the Middle East, Iran and, and Turkey, are not Arab. And it behooves the Arabs not to submit to non-Arab domination or superiority. And so therefore, this is a, a built-in division within the Arab world. It's, not, it's Sunni Shia, but it's also Arab, non-Arab. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, uh, the Middle East is, for what one can say, is really in political chaos. The Arab, the Arab world is in political chaos. It's obvious to us in a way, but I'm just it's kind of raising it to a broader a more generalized level. I mean, if one looks at Egypt in terms of Islamic terrorism there, the breakdown of Syrian rule, let's say, or order, Iraq fissured Sunni Shia, Arab Kurd, and so on, and some other Arab countries in the same kind of situation. We're talking, the breakdown of the Arab world, it's a, it's a very salient moment in, in modern Arab history, but it reflects upon the breakdown of Islam as well as being unable to unite them, to unite all of the Muslims, be they Arab or non-Arab. And that's something which is a moment of reckoning for the Arab world. And how can we translate that into the uh, dynamic relationship between the West and this uh, Muslim world at large? It's a question of ends and means. Uh, what does Islam uh, writ large want? Um, is it a tolerant uh, religion or civilization, as Dr. Nissan uh, mentioned, or does it want to impose, to dictate its uh, uh, rule or its Sharia, its its laws uh, to others. Um, if it it only wants to defend itself to protect the believers from outside influences, that's one thing. But if it wants to encroach on other people's stuff, then it's something else altogether. Terrorism, of course. Um, many uh, terrorists have been Muslim. A fraction of all Muslims in the world are. Terrorists. Of course, um, uh, one cannot say that terrorism equals Islam or, or vice versa. But the fact is that there were and still are several terrorist organizations whose declared aim is to bring Islam to other countries and continents. Uh, please add to that the fact that where there are immigrants, where there are enclaves of immigrant communities who are Muslim, they do not assimilate um, very easily into Western societies by their own choice. Now, this is a second generation uh, phenomenon. The earlier uh, Turkish immigrants in Germany wanted to become German. Their offspring or newly arrived immigrants do not. And therefore, um, it causes resistance on the part of the host country too. Ms. Lear? If you look at that earlier immigration, the figures today suggest that there's something like 13 million Muslims inside Europe and something like 3.5 million inside the United States. But as you say, the, the extremist element is on the fringe. So the majority of them are well integrated into Western societies. They're very successful and they're perhaps the perfect example of how the West and the Muslim world can cooperate and live side by side. You asked the question in terms of where does the Muslim world see itself today, but where does the West see itself today? We are also a very divided Western world. You have 
political instability, you have populist movements that have come to the fore, you have economic concerns, you have a, a range of issues that the West is not even speaking in a single voice either. So to be fair, and if you just look at the policies of Donald Trump, he says something and then he acts differently and he's not necessarily in accordance with the Europeans. So it's not like you're holding to a scale with two equal weights and either side knows what the other side is thinking. Dr. Nissan? If we follow uh, the um, Muslim uh, migration to Europe in particular, which uh, in a way began somewhere in the 60s, when Europe, in particular France, France politically led the European community, then the European Union today, France basically led in uh, inviting, accepting, trying to integrate very large numbers of Muslims. From, to France came the Muslims from North Africa, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco, in particular former French uh, territorial possessions. But we have to look at it as a historical process. I mean, you come as a migrant, and then you settle, and you perhaps acquire citizenship, and you raise a family, and the families grow, and the communities, the Muslim communities expand. And then, as was pointed out, the Muslims are not apparently as easily amenable to uh, integrate slash assimilate the way other communities have done, meaning there's a certain sense of Islam, and here I'm talking in a very general sense, but something which is at the origins of things, that the Muslims come with a certain sense, be it subliminal or conscious, depending on each given Muslim, that they have a right to assert their supremacy over non-Muslims. This is embedded within the Quran. It's not something, let's say, that's embedded within Christianity or the New Testament, but it is embedded within the Quran. And there's been a successful, from the point of Islam, absorption of this idea, of an acceptance of this idea going back to the seventh century. So when Muslims come to Europe, we don't really know if we should only call them migrants. And on an individual level, they are probably, quote, innocent migrants looking for work and the like. But when the numbers expand, and we're talking not about thousands or tens of thousands, but now hundreds of thousands, like a country like Germany in, 19, in 2015 or 16 received about a million migrants, uh, more than 80% of which were Muslim. So maybe we're not talking about a migratory population or a refugee population fleeing Syria, for example, but maybe we're talking about something which has a certain aura of being an invasion. An invasion, again, not necessarily in a violent terrorist sense. An invasion of peoples who carry with them in their hearts, within their faith, the idea that they're not coming to submit to a foreign culture, but at a first stage to maintain their own native culture, and then maybe to... Uh, impose it, if they can, on in the public domain. And in that sense, therefore, there's something very historic about this, again, going back to the origins of Islam and Muhammad's own story about <coughs> his, uh, his hijra from Mecca to Medina. It's a kind of hijra now of masses of Muslims to a place where they can be more free, perhaps, than even in the Muslim countries they came from. And that in itself is a great irony. Add, add, to that, add to that the perception, perhaps this is not an established fact or, or not always, but there is the perception that uh, Islam um, is a sort of Hotel California where you can join but you cannot leave. Once you uh, come into uh, the faith, you, are, you cannot regret it. You, ca you cannot go back, you cannot revert <coughs> to, to your original religion. And of course, this runs against the grain of free choice, which is one of the tenets of, of uh, freedom, of uh, liberalism everywhere, especially uh, uh, since uh, uh, Calvin and Luther against the uh, Catholic uh, Church. And um, we mentioned Europe and Islam. Look at the case of Turkey. Turkey uh, is probably going to be the biggest, the largest um, population-wise country in the European Union if it is accepted, which is one reason it is not accepted. And um, the 300 million or so uh, other Europeans do not want the 80 million Turks or so, the 80 million Muslims, to have such a big voting power in the EU. So for, for the Turks, it signals that, and they resent it, they, it signals that they are not accepted as equals. It's not only uh, the voting power, but also the cultural influence. Uh, <clears throat> when we're looking at the Islamic Republic of Iran, for instance, a Shiite power across the Middle East, one of the major Muslim powers around the world, uh, 
they have uh, time and again declared the United States, which signifies the West in their perception, as the big Satan and Israel as a sm uh, small Satan. Uh, in Tasrih al-Fatiha, in the Quran, the first chapter of the Quran, there is a sentence that emphasizes, don't let me be like those, uh, referring to Christians and like Jews uh, who are under them as uh, uh, two predominant groups that uh, the Muslim world should be wary from and separate them from and make sure that they beat them. Uh, to what degree does this uh, political understanding that uh, the United States and Israel are the enemies of the Muslim world uh, go in line with the uh, Muslim perception of things and understanding of the Quran? Look, I think it, there's there's always the religion that can be used in political purposes. And I think it certainly is expediency and it certainly lends itself to whatever the politicians want to say. I'll come back to you in a moment. I just want to comment on the point Amir made. I think one of the fundamental problems with this whole discussion is that as much as you say it's innate to Islam, the idea of being able to practice and the idea of being able to influence wherever you are, it's innate to the Western world, the, the ideals of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of practice. And I think that's where part of the conflict starts coming in, because you wouldn't want to say in a Western society, let's put infringements and let's put limitations on, on, on how a Muslim community operates, because that goes against the grain of what defines them as, as a free society. And I think that is what we're starting to witness with the influx of refugees, is that Europe is really struggling in terms of how to welcome them and treat them as equal citizens and allow them to practice freely as Muslims at the same time not threatening themselves. But back to your point, the, the perception and certainly the expediency of using the United States and Israel as the threat is a way of mobilizing the society behind you. It's also a way of justifying anything that you want to do. My, my reading of the situation is that very much it is used in, in the political Islam in the sense that I understand it in, in political conversations and political goals. Dr. Nissan? I think uh, we should appreciate that democracy, the par paraphernalia of democracy, uh, citizenship rights and uh, freedom of speech and assembly and expression and the like, uh, are considered to be an enlightened program. You know, Nietzsche, a German philosopher, dying in 1900, uh, understood things differently. He understood democracy as a sign of decadence and not as a sign of enlightenment. I think most of us sitting around this table all would see democracy in a positive light, but he saw something else. When he looked at democracy a century and more ago, he saw that it's a leveling of people to the same status and that what he considered to be a, uh, a weakening of the higher virtues. And when you look at, therefore, democratic Europe today, facing this issue of the Muslim population there, one wonders if democracy as a political system with an array of values fits the Muslim population. I mean in two senses, if I may. The Muslim population, at least by the ideologues and those who narrate what the Muslims are about, want to say that democracy is indeed decadent because it allows all of the various uh, deviations to proliferate in society. What is in the eyes of these Muslims, deviations. Uh, sexual promiscuity, alcohol, uh, uh, ch sex changes, uh, whatever. An array of like social anarchy. So in that sense, democracy is considered by such Muslim spokespersons in a negative way. But from the European perspective now, it's a sense in which democracy may not fit all of the situation because it's willing to grant equality and freedom or array of liberties to people who don't merely want to enjoy that liberty to express themselves, but to use it for another purpose. Meaning the whole idea, for example, in Islam of Dawah, to missionize. Christians don't missionize, let's say, in the streets of Geneva, and Jews don't missionize in the streets of London, and the Sikhs and the Hindus and Buddhists and Confucians also don't missionize. Meaning, it's a, we accept you and you accept me, and let's go on with our own individual lives. But Islam has a different view of it. So here, the idea of a grant of freedom of expression to Muslims is used by the Muslims for a specific and historically grounded religious purpose, propagating Islam in the public domain, which is really not kind of the democratic program. The democratic program is let, I, live and let live, not that I'm trying to enter into your private space 
-hmm. and affect uh, your identity and your way of life. Mr. Ogan, I'd like to get back to uh, something you noted earlier about Mohammed bin Salman coming and trying to define uh, the various forms of Islam, if you will. <clears throat> uh, he just visited uh, France, uh, and during his visit, he had a lot of protests against uh, this visit uh, due to the various values uh, that France perceives as uh, uh, dire for human rights and, and freedom of speech and so on, something that is not a, a vocal uh, chord or a cornerstone of uh, the Saudi uh, uh, monarchy, uh, which is an understatement. But uh, to what degree does this impact the the business dealings between France and Saudi Arabia, which are vast. And to what degree does this actually persuade the government to avoid certain uh, elements with uh, regard to economic as well as military expeditions with the Saudis? It doesn't seem uh, to have an impact yet. Uh, President Macron wants uh, to have a lot of business uh, with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, as does uh, President Trump. But underlying your question is the illusion that there is a difference between religion and nationalism. Um, the uh, Israelis, some 30 years ago, when the Palestinian national movement uh, seemed to be on the rise, headed by the PLO or Fatah, tried to cultivate the leaders of Hamas. Because Hamas at the time, as was said, it was a dawa and uh, was seen as a, as a civic uh, forum, um, which uh, one can have a compromise with. There was this illusion in the West that clergy are men of peace. This is, of course, especially uh, since the uh, Holy Roman Empire is no longer with us and the Vatican uh, seems to, to be uh, devoted uh, to uh, its own religious uh, business. And uh, in Israel, the, the uh, rabbis are uh, seemingly separate from, from the government. But it is not like that in Islam. Um, in, uh, in Iran, uh, perhaps uh, they are now following in the footsteps of the old Persian Empire, but they are trying to export an Islamic revolution, which is what the Saudis are trying to be a bulwark against. So uh, it is a bit uh, uh, petty uh, on the part of uh, some uh, demonstrators in the West um, uh, to be to criticize uh, the Saudis. Um, who are yes, they, they are they are uh, perhaps retrograde. Uh, perhaps perhaps uh, uh, they should reform faster. But he is uh, the guy who is trying to rush in those reforms. He is not the right target for these uh, protests. Well, we're about to end the program. So, Miss Lear, last sentence from you. I think it points to political expediency. We can talk about how Islam is different to the Western world, but at the end of the day, countries are going to want to cooperate with each other, whether it's for economic purposes, whether it's for political purposes, and those kind of concerns will always override the deeper religious concerns. Well, this is all the time that we have for today, so I'd like to thank Ms. Lear, Mr. Oren, and Dr. Nissan for coming here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we'll see you again next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.